All right, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 9 tonight. I mentioned Sunday morning that Hebrews 7, 8, 9, and 10 are just powerful. It's a powerful passage of Scripture. And encourage you to be, to be reading it. We've covered chapter 7 and 8. Uh, it, it's looking at Jesus as the high priest, Jesus as the superior high priest, the superior sacrifice, uh, the heavenly tabernacle superior to the earthly tabernacle, uh, the blood of Christ superior to, to the blood of the sacrifices at the tabernacle and the temple. I mean, it's just an all-encompassing look at how Jesus is, is the fulfillment and, and the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. So if you haven't really read and gotten into that, 7, 8, 9, and 10, I just encourage you to push all that together and dive into it and let it speak to you. It's, it's, a, it's a precious passage of scripture. Uh, so we're going to go to chapter 9 tonight. Chapter 9. Some of this ought to sound pretty familiar from, from Sunday morning. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. The tabernacle was set up, and in its first room were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna. Aaron's staff that had budded the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. That's not me saying that, that's him saying that. Uh, the, writer, the writer of Hebrews. Uh, this ought to sound real familiar. Now is there something that sticks out there, anything that sticks out in those first five verses of Hebrews 9 that catches your eye as maybe a little different or unusual in what's presented? Take a good look. Where? earthly place of holiness sounds kind of odd. Are you talking about first one? Is that where, where you're looking at? Um, yes. Okay, an earthly place of holiness. Okay, that's, that's, what translation do you have? Um, Just out of curiosity. ESV. Okay. The altar of incense was outside. Yeah. Yeah. Do y'all notice that? The way, he, the way the writer is describing this, the altar of incense is in the most holy place, the holy of holies. Now, everybody scrambles explaining that. And the, the basic explanation that is given uh, in study Bibles and commentaries is that the ministry at the, the altar of incense, is, which symbolizes the prayers of the people, is that it's just in front of the curtain whether you're talking about the, the, the tabernacle or the temple, and that those prayers make their way through the, you know, the slits and slots around the curtain into the, into the holy place to the Lord uh, because their prayers lifted to the Lord. And also on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest uh, goes in, he also takes a censer that has uh, some of the smoke lifted up from the, the prayers uh, or from the incense, symbolizing the prayers of the people that go in front, kind of covering and, and going over uh, the Ark of the Covenant. But it's really interesting that, because he very clearly says, it's inside the, the most holy place. Uh, it's the only place that ever says that. Everywhere else says it is a part of the holy place in front of the curtain separates the holy place from the most holy place. Anything else catch your attention? Well, I guess your first uh, thought would be, why? What, what has changed? What has changed 
Mm -hmm. It was of the old covenant mm -hmm. where it was one place. Yeah. But now in the new covenant, how is it in a different place? And that's ex and, answer, and that's exactly where he's gonna go. Yeah. That's he's setting up that that's the question he wants us to be asking. Right? right? Where does it go from there? What was it pointing to? Okay, and he's going to lead us in that in this in this chapter. I thought it was interesting that, that this is this is where one place very clearly it says the ark contained not only the tablets, uh, the stone tablets of the commandments, but it also contained the gold jar of manna, which uh, Exodus sixteen talks about. Uh, gathering that, that jar of manna, which, stop and think, the jar of manna. Remember when, when the family decided they were going to test God on this and they went out a second day or, or they wanted they got double what they needed the one day and kept it? And spoiled. Yeah, it spoiled, right, on, on the second day. Well, it didn't spoil in the ark. <laughs> okay? And, and then, the, then Aaron's staff, uh, that had budded, I believe that was number 17 that talks about that. Uh, so he's remembering what was, what was in the ark. Uh, okay? Anything else touch you in those first five verses? Because then he talks about the ministry of the priests. Verse 6, when everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room, which is the holy place, to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, the most holy place, and that only once a year, never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. Remember Sunday we were talking about the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, and how that functioned. Uh, that's what he's referring to here, very, very simply. Verse 8, the Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. Now, when he's talking about the most holy place, and up to this point, when we refer to the most holy place, we're referring to the Holy of Holies, the second room in the tabernacle or the temple. Is that what he's referring to here? Always keep you Is that what he was referring to here? What's he referring to here with the, with the most holy place? Heaven. Yeah, he's talking about the heavenly tabernacle. I just cut my fingernails yesterday. <laughs> Long fingernails can be helpful. Okay, so the most holy place he's referring to here is actually heaven itself. All right. Uh, verse 9, this is an illustration for the present time. All right, when was the present time? Not 21st century, okay. This is an illustration for the present time, which was sometime before A.D. 70. Sometime before the temple was destroyed because the temple was still standing and still in use at this point. So this is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They're only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applying until the time of the new order. Kind of getting at your question, right? But this is all pointing to something else. And, and how the ministry of the tabernacle, the forgiveness of sins, it, it seems that its, its impact wasn't life-changing. It was... It was a ritualistic way of, of seeking forgiveness of God. Remember the scapegoat, the second goat, the hands on the head of the goat taken far out into the wilderness so that, that, that 
symbolizing sins being far removed. But the new covenant goes beyond outward to inward. Change of heart, change of thinking, change of mind from the inside out. Let's go ahead and look at verse, start at verse 11. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. Let me stop just for a second. I want to ask you something. Verse 11, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, what do you think he's talking about? Matter of fact, how does the ESV, the New King James, the RSV, any other translations you have, how, how does it translate the first half, first part of verse 11? NIV says the good things that are already here. Do you have anything different? Worded differently? New King James says the good things to come. All right, the good things to come. That's interesting. How about another translation? Future. I'm sorry? Future. Okay. Do you know what translation that is? By chance? It's the telephone translation. The telephone? <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, well, you can't trust that at and then. It might be a little haywire. Good things that have come. And you have ESV? Good things that have come. All right. So it must be, you know, I did not look real close at the Greek, and it wouldn't really matter. Somebody else would have to tell me. Okay, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm sorry. <laughs> you were looking at me like, oh, man. <laughs> I'm guessing that if you, if you take the, the translations of that verse that we're hearing, there's one way to look at it that's trying to capture the fact we already have it as he's writing it. There's another piece of the translation that's pointing to the future saying it's, we don't have it all yet. And that probably, when you put the two together, is a pretty good capture of what the Greek is actually saying. What, okay, in this time, he, as, as he's writing this, what do we already have? The message says it's like a new covenant. All right, the new covenant. Thank you, Eugene Peterson. Bring it right in there, right? The new, the new covenant what we already have is salvation. What we already have is, is a savior. What we already have is a relationship with God. What we already have is, is a, well, at that point, a growing word. Not complete yet, but a growing word. Talk about the scriptures. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the church. Now, if you're going to take the, the, the translation that looks at that more future, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are future, what would that be? What would that include? I know the answer. Verse 11, when, uh, do you have it right there, uh, Eddie? Do you have it right there, verse 11? Yes. Can you read it for us, verse 11? For just the first part. All right, right there. Just stop right there. So the NIV says good things that are already here. That translation says good things of the future. So what might it be pointing to if it says good things of the future? It's already, it's already happened. Already happened. Second coming. Eternal life, right? Absolutely. A church that just keeps growing. I mean... I mean, the Great Commission was going around all the world, right? Well, it was just getting started at this point. And we're on the other side of the world. So we're a part of that future. Yes? It seems that they're still calling it the covenant. Or, um, but technically, what you're looking at is that the old order passed away. Right. All of the old Jewish 
flaws and everything, it all passed away. So they are still considering calling it that, but they're not. What they're really describing is the church. Mm -hmm. See, the, it's, you need to see how the old order was set up, how the new order right. is set up, and it will tell you how the church is different mm -hmm. than the old Jewish order. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're lo really and, looking at. And he's going to keep... He's going to keep moving to explain all that. Yes, right. Okay? All right. When Christ came as high priest, verse 11, of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. That is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. Obviously, he's pointing to heaven, right? Verse 12, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls, the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. How much will he cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? It's a very inside-out cleansing. Uh, soul, spirit, cleansing. A very complicated uh, way to get to the end. <laughs> Which is, you think there's a lot of words there? There is more words than I can even comprehend. But you know, if, if you look at it, let's go to verse 12. If, if you look at it, everything he's saying is really important. Jesus did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, which what have we been talking about, the Day of Atonement, the sacrificial system. He didn't enter that way. He entered the most holy place, not, not the earthly tabernacle, but the heavenly tabernacle. Once for all, very important, once for all, not something that had to be done time and time again. And he's even going to repeat that a little later on. It seems so tortured. The wording? Okay. One person. And to, to, to come in and try to understand. I probably wouldn't start with Hebrews 9 <laughs> with a brand new Christian. But for us. Yeah, I know. But what, still it's difficult. For me. <laughs> once for all, by his own blood. Right? We think about the unblemished, sacrificial Lamb of God having obtained eternal redemption. Not just the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, but forever. Through Christ, the unrestricted access to yes. the Father. Yes. As a matter of fact, and his question in a nutshell in verse 14 is how much more will what Christ did for us matter to us and make a difference to us as opposed to what was done on the Day of Atonement year after year after year. The old sacrificial system. Was the Day of Atonement just a symbolic thing or did it really do anything? Well, it was, it was established by you God. To really forgive people's sins? I mean, what if you, you know, sometimes when you read, sometimes when you read, like when you read the Day of Atonement, it sounds like there's forgiveness of sins. Sometimes when you read the book of Hebrews, it's like saying, but it just wasn't complete. It just didn't, it didn't do what it needed to do, and it was a failed system. But it was a system designed to show us our need for a Savior, our, 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 our own sin and shortcoming. I mean, it repeatedly showed us that. Um, How did those people get to heaven if they didn't? Just by obeying the law, they didn't have Jesus. 
Yeah, if you, if you think back, and this will take us, this takes us all the way back to Abraham in Genesis. And he makes a big deal about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, Hebrews makes a big deal about it. It's by Abraham's faith, not the works that he did. It's, it's, it's faith in who God is. It's, it's being, um, matter of fact, this is all setting us up for Hebrews 11. But which those is where, laws were part of that faith, though. Sure, sure, yeah. Do you think the people like us, kind of thinking maybe what Kay's thinking when, when we've been reading this, would those people, would they, would they, would they have been frustration like, you know, like they just have to keep doing those things over and over? I mean, did, did they feel forgiveness? Like we can, like we can. Not having lived in that day and time, man, and going through this, <laughs> Uh, what they felt, I, I, it seems like, I, there, would be, it seems like there would be, I, I don't know, it seems like tortured is the word. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking frustration. Like I like think, I think there's a lot of words that would describe it, and one that comes to my mind is incomplete. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like it's not finished. Like it's incomplete. Not done. It's, but it's pointing. Yeah. It it's was, pointing it was to what's coming. An external. External. Not internal. Yeah. from the external mm -hmm. to the internal mm -hmm. because you're continually washing and cleaning right. and trying to uh, purify the outer man with the idea that slowly that would permeate down into the inner man where he would be able to eventually enter in. Mm -hmm. Whereas the new covenant exactly the opposite. Right. It was one payment right. and it was by the blood of Jesus right. And it enters into the person one time. It's right. called by faith unto grace. Grace, yeah. So here, it's the faith inside of you. Mm -hmm. It's alive and it's active. The law was dead. Mm -hmm. The faith mm -hmm. is alive and active inside of you continually. Once you receive faith into you, you are not your own choice any longer, even though you don't right. choose to go that way. The faith is alive in you, working in you, continually uh, uh, making every effort possible to bring you to a place of grace. And that you, uh, as if you respond favorably to that, that faith, that faith will, from the inside out. Right, it's, it's the inside out, and, yeah. And, and developing, yeah. where outwardly you come to be, you come to the place where it says, this is, this is where the transition is. It says, I am crucified with Christ to so I no longer live. Right, Galatians 2.20. Right. initially that word of faith, die. Right. He says, I am crucified in Christ so I no longer live. Right. He says, the life that I live here on the earth, and this can be achieved if you will just follow the right. process. Right. He says, the life that I live here on the earth, I do so by faith in the Son of God right. who loves me and takes care of me. At that right. point, you are able to enter in. Well, the moment you accept Christ as your Savior. That's exactly right. The moment you accept Christ that's as your Savior, you are, you are right with God. It is an inside-out process. That's Some of the questions have been dealing with, gee, that would have been frustrating in the yeah. Old Testament. I guess Testament. I more peace. I know the peace I have. Right. Right. I know that I have the Holy Spirit, and I know that He's there with me all the time. Mm -hmm. So, right. I just don't know. Well, I mean, they didn't have a constant. Did they, they didn't yeah. know, right? They didn't, didn't know what? I mean, they didn't. We're looking at it from this right. end. How, they, they just knew they. Uh, all they knew they is that this is what we were told to do. They didn't have this. <laughs> I mean, they were listening to the priests. They they didn't have. Yeah. They didn't have the scriptures. They they were they were going with the system as it was presented to them, and uh, I'm sure at times it had to be very frustrating. I'm, well, they couldn't have had peace. Well, I, when you stop and think about it, how many how many people today seek to find that peace in all kinds of ways apart yeah. 
apart from the grace of, of Christ. And how frustrating that gets for folks sometimes. How many times they, they set these goals. They set, they set that, that they're going to do things this way, a certain way. They're not going to get angry anymore. They're not going to use profanity against their family. They're not, they're not going to lose their temper and, and, and on and on and on. I'm not going to drink anymore. I'm not going to uh, overeat anymore. Whatever. Whatever. How many times do you get frustrated? Okay, this is... It's amazing how we forget. We just don't appreciate Jesus and the Holy Spirit of the Bible that we do. Oh, my. That That's why I, I so often say we are so fortunate to live today. No matter how some of you might feel like, gosh, I wish I lived any other time but this. <laughs> we are so fortunate to live today. To have the gifts that God has given us. Gift of understanding. And the understanding, yes. Yes. Um, well, verse 15 says, For this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. He's the mediator. He's the one between us and God, okay? And, and, and there was no other way that could happen. Uh, John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And, and this is why. No one's holy and sinless, right? Except Jesus. No one has taken his, our sins upon themselves. No one could. No one could take the judgment for our sins upon themselves. No one could... Could, could die for us and overcome the effects of sin and death and the grave except Jesus. And then he entered into to, to the holy tabernacle, the heavenly tabernacle, and is our mediator. John? Last week the term mediator came up in our study also. I have a question. How, do we, how can we define mediator? In this case, Christ is a mediator. Mm -hmm. My idea of a mediator is someone who comes between two parties and they negotiate uh, a settlement or an agreement. But we have nothing to offer God. No. How, right. How, what do we... What God well, that's, how, that's what makes him our mediator. Yeah. We have nothing to offer. Right. And he says, I, on your behalf, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm taking your sins upon myself. Okay, so... Yes. And, and he's negotiating with God. He's not negotiating with God, but God is giving us salvation. It's the plan, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and and instead of mediator, he's our sacrifice. He, he is he is our ultimate sacrifice. Um, when it, when I think about, it still comes down at some point. He is our he is my mediator if I embrace him as my savior. Okay. Until I do that, he offers to be my savior. He's done everything there is to be my savior. But I've got to, I've got to make the decision to accept that gift. And, and then, as a matter of fact, uh, let's bounce around for a minute with that term mediator. Okay. 1 Timothy 2.5. I'll go back up to three. First Timothy two, start at verse three. Uh, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved. That's his desire. All people to be saved. And to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. Giving himself as a ransom for all is what empowers him to be the mediator. I understand that completely. But we have nothing to offer. God offers us great right. love and, sal right. and salvation. Salvation is, is, is we, a gift. We is have a nothing gift. to offer. There's nothing that we can do to make a contribution to this. Oh, 
I think, I think if, if I would read Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, I think you would, I think this is exactly what you're saying. You can tell me. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. You've got nothing to offer. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, right? That, was that kind of, is that what you're saying? We don't, we, well, when you say we've got nothing to offer, yeah, nothing to offer. For, for our salvation, there's not, no, it, we're, we're helpless. Right. We're hopeless, powerless. In, in Romans 5, Paul even says, he says we're, we're helpless, we're powerless, and we're his enemies because of our sin. Uh, yeah, it's like, if I would give you a gift, there's nothing that you can contribute to that gift, except to receive. Right. And we're the same way right. in regard to faith and grace. Right. We can't do anything. I could take that box of that gift and toss it right back at you. But you had still right. initially done that. Right. And some people do just that. Right. They will initially receive, and then they will, in a sense, throw the gift. Right. They, they choose to not follow the faith. Yep. Uh, that we are, we are saved by faith, but if you look at that word and how it's worded, it's called future tense. Mm -hmm. It means you initiate faith and then it must grow. That faith is a gift faith. from God. It must continue yeah. to grow in right. you uh, as, you, as you go along. But by the way, John, right? It's so, I was always fascinated the very next verse. We do have nothing to give. We have nothing to offer when it comes to being in right relationship. But the very next thing he says is, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I've got not a thing to offer. I can't make myself right with God. It's only through what Christ has done for me. But as I accept that gift, as I accept who he is as my savior and he gives me the precious gift of his Holy Spirit then he's got a plan for me for you he's got things for us to do for the kingdom were you going to say something Jenny? yeah I just I mean I'm just looking at it on my nook so I pulled up the dictionary and it just said for mediator to intervene between people in order to bring about an agreement for reconciliation so the reconciliation piece would be <laughs> The part of the definition that really hits home. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's a mediator between man and God. Mm -hmm. Well, as a matter of fact, First John. Remember First John one nine. Mm -hmm. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. And then, if, if you go to chapter 2 of 1 John, it says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, our mediator, right? He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Don't you love this? <laughs> that term That's good. I think it's good. good. What the, the term reconciliation, in other words, just like in, a, in an accounting process, you can re reconcile numbers if you can find flaws and, and find out what it takes to correct them. So as a result of being our mediator, Christ is all able to reconcile us before the Lord. He reconciles our sin. Before God, because He has taken God's judgment. I never thought about it from an accounting point of view. I like that. That's good. That's good. Okay. Everything by numbers. Well, good, good discussion tonight. Um, a lot of good stuff here. So I hope I hope you take your time. Keep keep reading. Keep pondering. Keep digging. Write out what you're thinking. Any questions that you have. Um, 
And we'll finish up chapter 9. And I don't know, we might move into chapter 10 next week. We'll see. Um, we got a couple more weeks at least through through 9, rest of 9 and into 10. And But go back, if you haven't done it, go back and read 7, 8, 9, and 10 and put it all together. And take notes. Things that, that are striking you that, that are that are uh, maybe giving you some understanding about things that that are clear that weren't weren't clear before, and uh, well, that's very nice of Gay. Okay, let's stand together for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Sometimes we read your word and it just is so easy to grasp. Sometimes we read your word and, and we really have to stop and almost go word by word or phrase by phrase and let your spirit speak to us. We just thank you for your word. We thank you for its truth. And, and Lord, as I look at these chapters, I'm, I'm so taken by, by how these chapters in Hebrews go all the way back to the second book of the Bible and truly the first book. It follows our need and follows how Christ is the fulfillment. We thank you so much for what you teach us and how you, how you speak to us through your word. Keep us hungry for your word. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.